Night's Take, um, you know, he didn't have television at the time. He was kind of getting these secondary reports. That's right, Leanne. For a long time, I didn't question the official conspiracy theory. And that's what it is. It's officially a conspiracy theory. But is it a true theory? And when we look at an investigation, we have to use deductive reasoning. Remember the quote from Sherlock Holmes? He said, when you eliminate the impossible, what remains, no matter how improbable, is the truth. Let me read to you what the NORAD general told the 9-11 Commission staffers. He said, the real story is actually better than the one that we told. And of course, the, what he's talking about is what happened with the NORAD stand down. There were multiple drills that were going on. That's now a hallmark of these false flag events. We saw it happen again in London with the 7-7 bombing, running a exact same scenario in the exact same time and place. Concurrent with the event, they're running a scenario that looks exactly like that. And of course, Gore, Gore Vidal had a problem with that many years later. He says, I don't believe this for a minute. They went 100 minutes without putting jets up. That is not standard procedure. I went back and I looked at the Vanity Fair article, and this was something that an associate producer of the film United 93 was talking about. He said it took him seven months to get any transcripts from NORAD. And he said there was a lot of confusion that was going on there. Now, of course, he looks at it and he goes, this is so confusing for people. This is so far beyond uh, what you would expect out of a coincidence that many conspiracy theorists <laughs> think that that's a smoking gun. I do think it was a smoking gun because it isn't a it isn't a uh, co coincidence when you've got four or five military drills all operating at exactly the same time when nobody does their their job they look up and they see the CNN art, uh, monitor and they say is this the uh, are these the tr uh, planes that we've been following as part of this exercise and they go well, those are the planes you're following but it's not an exercise and of course we know that Operation Northwoods going back to the 1960s was part of that but I didn't see that for a very long time because I wasn't watching television. I was simply getting radio reports. What I was concerned about was how they were going to use this to enact something like the Patriot Act. I'd seen how they'd use civil asset forfeiture, SWAT teams of the drug war. I was concerned this was going to be part of the uh, focus for an authoritarian government. That's what I was focused on for a long time. And you were right. Right, and you were absolutely right. It rolled out so fast. There was no doubt that, that the patriotism was absorbed to take us into a war on false pretenses of weapons of mass destruction. Right. Now, when we come back, we're going to get uh, Darren Green's pages, right? take. I mean, this is the 28 pages. This is how we can kind of pull this thing around. Well, this could change the world. We don't know what's in the documents. They're blacked out. But there is a growing movement uh, amongst uh, congressmen, senators, and the American people to get Obama to declassify the 28 pages that yeah. were taken out of the 9-11 Commission report. We're going to take a look at it when we get back. The mainstream media initially blew the whistle on the highly suspicious, aggressive surges of the trading of put options on American Airlines and United Airlines just before the 9-11 tragedy. We've also begun a major investigation into whether someone or many people benefited financially from the evil done to the country last Tuesday. However, that coverage of the investigation quickly came to a screeching halt. American lawyer Jim Rickards related in his book, The Death of Money, how on September 26, 2003, John Mulherin and I were seated side by side in a fourth floor meeting room in the headquarters complex. Mulherin was one of the most legendary stock traders in Wall Street history. I was responsible for modeling terrorist trading for the CIA, part of a broad inquiry into stock trading on advanced knowledge of the 9-11 attacks. I looked in his eyes and asked if he believed there was insider trading in American Airlines stock immediately prior to 9-11. His answer was chilling. It was the most blatant case of insider trading I've ever seen. Be that as it may, Jim Rickards and other mainstream media financial pundits would distance themselves from the ugly notion that prior knowledge of 9-11 was known to government officials and Wall Street traders. The indisputable truth is, inside trading was in an uncanny feeding frenzy, gorging on foreknowledge as put options surged on the very companies that would be blindsided by the attack. Reinsurance companies Munich RE and Swiss RE nearly doubled the level of shares traded normally days before the attack. Financial services Merrill Lynch and Morgan Stanley with offices in the towers saw huge surges in put options traded days before the attacks. Morgan Stanley, which saw an average of 27 put options on its stock bought per day before September 6th, 
saw 2,157 put options bought in the three trading days before the attack. Merrill Lynch, which saw an average of 252 put options on its stock bought per day before September 5th, saw 12,215 put options bought in the four trading days before the attack. Morgan Stanley's stock dropped 13% and Merrill Lynch's stock dropped 11.5% when the market reopened. The SEC quickly put on a show for the public, deputizing hundreds of officials to investigate and essentially cover up the beneficiaries of the put option feast. In October of 2001, SFGate reported in a two-page statement issued to all securities-related entities nationwide, the SEC asked companies to designate senior personnel who appreciate the sensitive nature of the case and can be relied upon to exercise appropriate discretion as point people linking government investigators and the industry. By deputizing these officials, the SEC had essentially made it impossible for the investigators to disclose publicly what they had discovered. The blame for the spending spree on the profits of doom were erroneously attributed to the agents of the terror attack. Agents scattered from the official story as it becomes increasingly obvious that the Saudis were pulling the strings in collusion with their Bush family allies right here in the good old US of A. Weapons manufacturer Raytheon increased its stock sixfold on the day before the 9-11 tragedy as Tomahawk missiles would be selling like hotcakes in the very near future. And the go-to financial protection of five-year treasuries soared as the United States unexpectedly faced a horror dominated by unanswered questions 14 years later. Meanwhile, the rest of America's last free act of independence appears to be the ability to change the channel in order to view the latest in Overton window entertainment as the truth runs wild into the misty darkness of the American night. The investigation scared a lot of the investors as two and a half million of put options on United Airlines went mysteriously unclaimed. Wall Street demons, and you know who you are. We will never forget, we will never surrender. You will pay the high price for making a deal with the devil. John Bound for Infowars.com. Rand Paul has joined the fight to get the federal government to release the missing 28 pages of the official 9-11 commission report. And that was blocked and kept secret by the Bush administration. And that's because they know full well that the documents will prove once and for all that the Saudi Arabian government was directly involved in the attacks on September 11th. So very embarrassing, not to mention treasonous by George Bush and Dick Cheney, who are both implicated here in a massive cover up. And remember, it was George W. Bush himself, the hypocrite, who had this to say about anyone harboring terrorists. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. Oh, is that right, Georgie? It's going to be like that, huh? You're either with us or you are with the terrorist. Well, you're the one, George W., who vacations with the Saudi royal family. And you're also the one who used to vacation with the bin Laden family. And you're also going to find yourself in prison if these documents ever see the light of day. This sort of shocking when you read it, as I read it, and we all had our own experience, I had to stop every couple pages and just sort of absorb and try to rearrange my understanding of history for the past uh, 13 years and the years leading up to that. It, it challenges you to rethink everything. And so uh, I think the whole country needs to go through that. That's right. These brave gentlemen have seen the 28 pages and they want the documents released. You heard Representative Thomas Massey say right there that it will challenge you to rethink everything. Whatever is in those documents is going to change world history. I want those documents declassified. I'm embarrassed to be associated with a work product that is secret. But wait, there's more. Former Senator Bob Graham 
who also co-chaired the joint Senate House investigation into the September 11th attacks, he says, I am convinced that there was a direct line between at least some of the terrorists who carried out the September 11th attacks and the government of Saudi Arabia. He called it a smoking gun. And he went on to say, the reason for this cover-up goes right up to the White House. Meanwhile, here's what they are saying in the New York Post. The Saudis deny any role in 9-11, but the CIA in one memo reportedly found incontrovertible evidence that Saudi government officials, not just wealthy Saudi hardliners, but high-level diplomats and intelligence officers employed by the kingdom helped the hijackers both financially and logistically. And if the Saudi government did indeed help finance and train the hijackers, well, that, my friends, that is an act of war. And I'm so glad to see the truth finally beginning to surface. Senator Rand Paul has just introduced legislation called the Transparency for the Families of 9-11 Act. And that would force the Obama administration to release the 28 pages. Over a decade ago, a bipartisan congressional committee investigated the 9-11 attacks and wrote a report. 28 pages from that report have never been released to the public. We're here today to call for the release of those 28 pages. The survivors, civilian heroes, and families of the victims of September 11 terrorist attacks some of whom are here today, deserve the full truth. We cannot let page after page of blanked out documents be obscured behind a veil, leading these families to wonder if there is additional information surrounding these horrible acts. So there you have it. Rand Paul thinks that we all have the right and that the 9-11 victims' families have the right to see what's in those documents, no matter how embarrassing or how incriminating it might be to George W. Bush. So what do you say there, W? Why don't you let us see what's in those 28 pages? After all, you've got nothing to hide, right? I mean, either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. I'm Leanne McAdoo with InfoWars.com, reporting here from Times Square. I am standing next to Rudy Dent. He's a 32-year veteran of the New York City Fire Department. He's worked as well with the New York City Police Department. And you retired right after 9-11. He was there on 9-11. He saw World Trade Center Tower 7 come down. Rudy, tell us about what happened that day. Well, I was off that day, and I, got a, I received a call at home, and uh, I got to see both buildings come down on TV. I jumped on my motorcycle, I did about 120 miles an hour across the Tappan Zee, I reported to my firehouse, and then I uh, got my gear, uh, a bunch of us got together, we commandeered a, a mail truck and we made our way down to the, to the site. Uh, at that time, World, uh, Building 7 was still up. Uh, I saw Building 7 come down. Uh, my fellow firefighters who were there, they did that involuntary jerk when a loud explosion goes off, you know, you, you can't help it. And they did. Uh, I'm a, a Vietnam veteran too, so I kind of didn't jump like they did, but uh, it was, there was an explosion. The building did come down in complete classical uh, controlled demolition. It came down on its own footprint. There's no question about that. As a matter of fact, uh, Richard Gage from Architects and Engineers has completely handled that from his area of expertise. Okay. Now we heard uh, rumblings, things that the fire department was saying that they were overhearing Larry Silverstein talking about, uh, talking to his insurance company of whether or not he should have the building pulled. Um, in your professional opinion, was the building pulled? Well, let me say this. In the New York City Fire Department, I, as I said, I had 32 years there. I was a chauffeur and I was also a trained fire marshal. A fire marshal is considered an expert witness in court. He's like a, a forensic detective. He has the power to administer the oath, take testimony, and issue a subpoena. That's a lot of power. And he's, he's a highly trained investigative uh, 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 person in his area of expertise in arson and we have no term that I know of that says pulling buildings that's not our area of expertise we've never done that 